liked it to see. The person who runs these meetings, he couldn't be here today, so you're getting me and the rest of the B team to do the uh, legwork for you. But uh, I wanted to begin by just reminding everybody that since we're going to be talking about regulation today, that regulation is an activity that occurs at every level of government, uh, local, state, and federal. And uh, regulation is put in place for a lot of different purposes. Regulation controls access to businesses, control, controls access to markets, regulates the conduct of businesses when they're in markets, provides for the collection of revenue, provides for health and safety of the general public, and achieves broad social goals like clean air and water. Uh, and the but regulations that we have today or the agency that we have today, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, has regulations that touch all of those points. And I've asked the people who are presenting today, whom I'll introduce in a minute here, to also address a little bit about the process of delegation, the process by which legislatures delegate to administrative agencies the authority to develop and implement rules relying on the agency's expertise. And so joining us today from the PCA are Eric, uh, Eric David, the Ombudsman for Small Businesses, uh, Addison Otto, the Rules Coordinator, and Megan uh, Kuhlstevis, who is directly involved in the pre presentation of the new rules that you're going to be hearing about today. Uh, again, I think this is a very important topic and one that touches or has a potential to touch pretty much every small business in some way or another. So please, uh, PCA folks, take it away. Great, thank you, Charles and Neela. First, uh, can everybody uh, hear and see me okay? I'm I'm hoping so. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of tough to I tell on screen. Least. Thank you <laughs> very much. Thanks, Megan. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, allowing us to have a few minutes with you today to discuss environmental rules that are coming down the pipe that uh, may impact uh, folks on this call. Um, here's my contact information. Um, this is being recorded, so of course, if you don't have a pen handy, that's all right. Um, the folks at DEED also have my contact information as well. So here's what we'll uh, be talking about today. Um, I will touch base very briefly on our Small Business Environmental Assistance Program, or SBEEP, as we call it. Uh, Addison is on the line to discuss the rulemaking process in general. As Charles mentioned, kind of the overview uh, of what we do here at the PCA and how that relates to our uh, legislators. And then Megan uh, Kulsenis is uh, going to discuss the rules themselves. And this is where we will be spending the majority of our time um, today specifically on the air toxics reporting one is that is the one that is um, coming up the quickest, but we'll also touch base on three other uh, rulemaking processes as well. And then as we discussed earlier, well, plenty of time for questions. So we'll kind of go through this information at a high level and leave um, time for folks to uh, ask us questions. So again, very briefly, um, the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program, um, we have been around for a while. We are free and confidential. Um, so that's that's an important point. Uh, we do a, a wide variety of things at SBEEP, uh, complying with environmental rules, as we'll discuss today. Um, one of those things, if you're looking to reduce your emissions or waste, um, things like that, we can help with that. If you're looking to reduce your regulatory obligations, we can assess you know your need for an air permit and those kinds of things. And do, we do have grants and loans available periodically uh, for financial assistance. We work in a, a variety of environmental sectors, but we do specialize in air. That's where we have the most experience. But again, if, if you do have questions and need help, we're, we're happy to help however we may. Our loan program uh, has also been around for a while, but that is currently, um, you can request up to 75,000 uh, for a loan at 0% interest. And that has a seven year, up to a seven year repayment plan. So there's some other um, conditions about, you know, applications and things like that in here. I don't need to go over this uh, too uh, detail, but just want to let folks know that that is an option. Our grant program right now, we have a dry cleaner cost share for folks to go away um, from certain chemicals there. And 
We did have grants for refrigerants and vapor recovery. Those have been recently closed, but just an example of periodic grants that we do have come up from time to time. Um, our staff do site visits upon request. So if uh, you're you want somebody facility to kind of um, take a look at, you know, again with that free and confidential uh, lens, uh, we have staff to do that. We have training calculators, other things to print out on our website that can help small businesses uh, and environmental issues. And if you're just looking for ideas to go beyond compliance and kind of take that next step, we have folks to help there as well. Uh, and our toll free phone number and local phone number and website are all there. We have um, email um, inbox that folks can ask questions as well. So we're really, we hope to be a resource to help folks, uh, help small businesses specifically um, do a lot of things. So it's a good, it's a good tool there. Uh, we've got a great staff to help you out in a variety of ways there. So that was kind of SP as a, as a <laughs> very overview here, but uh, now we'll kind of I'll hand it over to Addison to discuss the rulemaking overview itself. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so my name is Addison Otto, and I am a rule coordinator here at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And my job is essentially to assist the technical teams that are really putting the meat on the rules that we're proposing and making sure that we are meeting all of the statutory requirements through the rulemaking process. And for those of you who are unaware of what the rulemaking process consists of, I wanted to give just kind of a brief overview before Megan gets into a little bit more of the nitty gritty of some of the rules that we're proposing. So Minnesota statute chapter 14 is also known as the Administrative Procedure Act. And this chapter of the statutes outlines and defines that rulemaking process and procedures for government agencies. Um, and within that, that statute rule, the term rule itself is also defined. And really the purpose of the administrative Jackie's procedure. Jackie's asking about a Yankee swing tonight. WNBA yeah. kickoff is too late. Oh, sorry. Oh, Someone's so mic is on. Um, but really the purpose of the Administrative Procedure Act is to provide oversight of the powers and duties that are delegated to each of the state agencies uh, to increase public accountability, participation in the rulemaking process, and access not only to the rulemaking process, but also government data. Uh, to ensure uniform procedures throughout government agencies that are pursuing rulemaking, and then also to simplify the process as much as possible um, and to increase the ease and availability of that rulemaking process. Um, so if you look at that statute, Chapter 14, it's going to include, um, you know, information regarding public hearing and record keeping and um, contested case procedures, uh, public access, judicial review, all of that. Um, but really, the uh, the main takeaway from that last slide is that the it's not the Wild West. And if it was, I'd probably be out of a job. But uh, there are procedures and steps for rulemaking that are outlined for us in statute. And then speaking of statutes, um, each agency has statutory authority to pursue rulemaking. So the MPCA has general statutory authority um, and, and that statutory authority is outlined in chapter 116.07. So if you were to pull that up, it would say uh, essentially that the MPCA can pursue rulemaking for any rules that result in the prevention, abatement, or control of water, air, noise, and land pollution. Uh, and that's, you know, regardless of anything else, we have that general statutory authority. Uh, in some cases, we also have specific statutory authority. And so in those cases, that's when the Minnesota State Legislature has mandated that the MPCA pursue rulemaking on a given topic. And for those um, where we have the mandatory uh, statutory authority, it's typically an 18 month deadline that the MPCA has to publish the notice of intent to adopt unless it's stated otherwise. So Megan's going to go into a little bit more detail on some of the rulemakings that we currently have in the hopper, but um, it just so happens that each of those does have that specific statutory authority. So they're, uh, most of them are running on a deadline and I've got the um, reference if anyone's curious the statutes and the session law references on the screen there. 
And then again, those new rules that those new rules that Megan is going to cover include air toxics reporting, air toxics regulations, cumulative impacts, and odor management. But she's going to spend most of her time talking about air toxics reporting. Thanks, Addison. Yeah, I'm I'm Megan Cool Stennis. Um, I am an air policy planner at the MPCA, and I'm the project manager for this rulemaking in particular, the Air Toxics Emissions Reporting Rulemaking. Um, regardless, I'm going to go fairly high level, fairly quickly. Um, but please do, if you have questions at the end, uh, I welcome them. Um, so, like Addison said, the legislature charged us um, to uh, do an air toxics emissions uh, reporting rulemaking, uh, and in that, um, and actually all of these, I will, I will even just say, all of these will just be for the Twin Cities Metro. Um, so I, that that's where all of the rulemakings were kind of um, decided. Uh, to let you know, kind of ahead of time, if you're from Greater Minnesota, just to, um, we're we're talking uh, about the Twin Cities Metro. Um, so this this air toxics emissions reporting rulemaking on um, what the legislature told us it had to be annual reporting of air toxics emissions for air permit holders. So um, if you do not have an air permit, we are not talking about you. <laughs> uh, but if you do have an air permit, it's most air permit holders except for registration option B facilities, which in the Twin Cities Metro, those are mostly uh, auto body shops. Um, that uh, that are uh, have hold the option B permit, um, and then it that kind of told us we we had the ability to uh, determine the methods for reporting, and then that we had that 18 month deadline to have it on notice of intent to adopt by November of this year. So we're on a pretty quick uh, quick timeline um, for this rulemaking. The other factor that they um, Go ahead to the next slide, Eric. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the other factor that they uh, told us is that we have five lists to consult um, to determine the the air toxics that need to be re reported. Um, so these are a, just a quick rundown of those lists. I, I'm happy to go into more detail if you want on on these. I was not planning on it, but um, that's where where we got most of our proposed uh, pollutants from these lists. Um, just to backtrack a smidge, um, uh, get us kind of level set here. What are air toxics? Air toxics are pollutants that are known or suspected to cause cancer or other serious health effects or adverse environmental effects. Um, so, so air toxics can include a number of different pollutants. Um, they can be, you know, pretty much all the metals are are in air toxics are considered air toxics. Um, dioxins and furans, which come from burning things, benzene, which is often from, from transportation, um, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS. Uh, you might've heard about those a little bit more. Uh, trichloroethylene, which was in the um, news uh, a couple years ago. Um, it's now banned in Minnesota for those folks with air permits um, and many, many more, uh, lots more um, air toxics that are out there. Uh, these impacts can really be pretty wide ranging um, in terms of human health. Uh, it can result in cancer, depending um, on on uh, the certain toxicity. Uh, it can be lead to respiratory issues or cardiovascular issues. Um, there's also a number of environmental impacts, including some some air toxics also uh, contribute to climate change. Um, where these are. Um, where these are uh, found, so these sources, um, air toxics are released pretty much anytime you burn something. So whether it's uh, fuel in a boiler or a wildfire like we had yesterday, uh, um, not that we had it here, but it, the, the pollution came from Canada, um, air toxics are, are released in all of those um, events. Transportation, um, burning fuel in vehicles also, um, as well as, as many processes at facilities, um, solvents can release air toxics, um, as well as many, many others. So why really we're, we're also looking at why, why we need to do this as well. Um, and we know that there are disproportionate impacts from air toxics, especially in the Twin Cities Metro. Um, 
that what you're looking at here is a is a map um, in the seven county metro area. 78% of block groups are above health benchmarks due to pollution from air toxics. Um, what a block group is an important uh, demographic analysis. It's a subset of a census tract um, where they gather all kinds of data and, and a large area where we can compare many factors um, demographically. And so um, of those 78% um, of the block groups that are above health benchmarks, 60% um, are in areas of concern for environmental justice. That's those are the areas on the map here that are um, have the blue slash blue slashes or the green um, area as well. And so, uh, so 60% of the, those are in EJ areas, which shows a disproportionate impact from air toxics in the metro area. So just very briefly, a couple of um, uh, our proposed rule concepts, I'll go over those uh, just super, super briefly. Um, so we included all the factors that the legislature told us, you know, just the Twin Cities Metro, um, just air permits, uh, not including option B facilities um, as well. And we so we had to define um, an air toxic reporting facility. Uh, for those facilities that would um, would report air toxics in the future. And then so we're uh, currently air toxics reporting is voluntary uh, on a triennial or every three year basis. So that is moving from a voluntary triennial to a required annual reporting. Um, and, and those would be due on April 1st. Um, of the following year. So we're we're proposing to start with the reporting year of 2026, which would be due April 1st of 2027. Um, we're also modeling our proposed rule, um, much like the current um, voluntary reporting. So we're not looking to surprise people uh, at all. Um, and so it would be completed in our in our already um, well-tested uh, e-services platform for submitting those um, uh, air toxics reports. Uh, so, and it, we're also looking at very similar uh, methodology and processes that if you do report criteria pollutants or the voluntary um, air toxics or greenhouse gases, um, very similar hierarchies and timelines and processes, et cetera. So we're at, um, like I said, we're on a pretty quick timeline here. We are in that development phase, um, but it feels like we we have no time before the fall. <laughs> uh, but we are definitely taking time right now um, to have a uh, what we're calling an informal comment period, uh, looking for feedback. We have proposed concepts available, um, and that that uh, comment period is open through next Wednesday, uh, May twenty second. Um, so uh, we're, we're definitely interested in hearing feedback right now as we've kind of developed some our, our, our main thoughts around what we're proposing um, and we're looking for feedback on those. And then November, um, that will start that real formal pro uh, public uh, process with um, an administrative law judge and, and um, review with the Office of Administrative Hearing. So it's not just the MPCA. Um, who's involved in this. Um, and then we would anticipate summer of 2025 that we would uh, actually have everything kind of processed and signed um, and adopt that rule. And then with 2026, that first reporting year. So like I said, we're ha we have a very, um, we have a, a feedback period open right now. I'm not gonna go through all these really specifically, but these are the types of Questions we're asking um, through uh, through that it's a it's called a smart comment is the website that it's through and I'll have a link here uh, in a slide or two um, but just to let you know what kind of questions we're looking for um, especially for you know we have some specific questions for facilities where this would be really um, particular to people who are uh, would have to have to comply with. Um, these rules we're we're literally looking for how to how to make this easier. Um, we we want it to be uh, relatively um, under or we want it to be understood and uh, and able and able to be done. So 
um, we're asking for for your help <laughs> on that if you have ideas. Um, we also kind of have some general public uh, questions as well. You are most welcome. You can go to the next slide um, so that people have that. Um, so you are most welcome to uh, fill out even if you don't have a facility um, that has an air permit. Uh, you're wel we welcome your comment. We would encourage you to read um, the proposed co uh, concept document uh, that we have on the smart comment web page. So you'll see here it says air toxic emissions reporting rulemaking. That's the that's a screenshot of the page. You'll go down a little further and it says review documents. Um, it's in there. That's our proposed concept document. Um, if you hold your phone up to the QR code, it should take you right to that uh, comment period. Um, if you want. And then um, if you want to be kept in the loop around what is uh, what's happening what, when we do go to uh, notice of intent to adopt that kind of thing, we also have an email list, a gov delivery email list uh, for you to be able to say uh, get updates when we have additional updates. Um, so this this QR code <laughs> is to send you to our air toxics emissions reporting page uh, on our MPCA website. At the bottom of that, you can sign up for the Gov delivery. You'll notice there's a similar thread <laughs> for all of these rules. Um, there, there'll be a link on each of these rule pages. Uh, you can go to that page, and at the bottom there will be the sign up for each and every one of those Gov delivery uh, lists. We we have a um, a, a gov delivery list for each of the different rules. Sadly or not sadly, I don't know. <laughs> There's not one way to sign up for all of them. Um, excellent, and Addison dropped those in the chat as well. Thank you, Addison. So, so I almost want to just like pause for a moment, set that aside. <laughs> that was the air toxics emissions reporting rule. Um, this is then similar but different. Um, the air toxics regulations rulemaking is an, is similar. So all those air toxics we talked about, all that applies as well. Um, but this would be to um, uh, regulate and and monitor uh, stack tests and and that kind of uh, thing around air toxics. Um, just in the Twin Cities Metro again, uh, just for air permit facilities, not option B. Um, but this is another uh, rulemaking that's happening as well. And they are on a longer timeline. Um, they're also in, in development uh, with their planned notice of intent to adopt not until May of 2026. So um, definitely in, in process there, they don't have necessarily a concept document yet because they have a lot of other things to figure out, but you are welcome to contact any of the folks on any of these web pages um, if you have feedback for them or want to learn more. Um, but this is the timeline for the air toxics regulations rulemaking. And again, so air toxics regulations rulemaking, this is to sign up for their uh, gov delivery list uh, as well. And then some a rulemaking also that you may have heard of it around cumulative impacts has a number of, of charges very specific uh, in the legislation that that um, they were required to to complete as part of this rulemaking. They've also been doing a lot of um, webinars lately uh, uh, to essentially co-learn um, uh, what what might be feasible and doable and it, of interest um, to people in, in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, so this rulemaking, again, very um, Twin Cities Metro, I did apologize. <laughs> this one is a little different uh, in that it deals with just um, areas of concern for environmental justice uh, in the Twin Cities Metro, but then also in Duluth and Rochester. Uh, and so, um, again, they have 36 months, to, uh, that May 2026 deadline. Um, so these are the environmental justice areas in this Twin City seven county metro. Um, and then there is even written in rule, it's it's like a one mile buffer around those um, areas. 
And then the, the these are the areas of concern for environmental justice in Duluth and Rochester. So this is the only rule that um, applies to um, areas outside of the Twin Cities metro uh, area area. And again, they're on that um, longer, slightly longer timeline uh, with that May 2026, but lots happening with the cumulative impacts um, as well. So if you want to sign up um, to learn more there, there's a lot going on. And then the last rule I'll talk about today is uh, around odor management. Um, and this um, is for all facilities, but this does not necessarily apply just to facilities that have air permits. So this would be a complaint-based um, uh, odor rule that that uh, we are working on there in the research phase. Um, they they were not kind of given a, a standard a, a deadline, um, but considering odors are uh, are kind of are included in kind of the cumulative impacts, they anticipate probably following something more closely to that timeline. Um, but uh, there's been a public uh, open you know open um, comment process for that. But as they get closer. They'll, I'm sure there will be a, a, um, a concept document that kind of explaining what, what they're proposing um, with the order management rule as well. And I'm not going to go over this, but just <laughs> we wanted to give you this. We're happy to share the PowerPoint. Um, wanted to give you uh, this so you can kind of see uh, where the comparisons are uh, compared to these four rules, because we know there's a lot. There's a lot there. I just went over a boatload of information <laughs> that we don't necessarily expect you to keep it straight, but happy to to take questions or um, clarify uh, along the way. And then um, again, there's that QR code to the smart comment for the air toxics regular. Um, see, I I even do it myself. Air toxics emissions reporting rule um, to to give feedback on that uh, concept document. That also is my contact information and Addison's contact information, and we are happy to take questions, comments, concerns, uh, thoughts, and feedback. So, thanks so much. Uh, this is Charles Schaefer from Deed, and I have two questions for you, Megan, that I hope are easy ones to answer. Uh, one going back to your comment that you don't require, uh, that none of the stuff you've said applies to people who are not air permit holders. What's the current emissions thresh threshold that requires a permit? Oh, that is a great question. And it really, ver or it really um, varies uh, based on what type of pollutant you would be emitting. Um, and so I know specifically uh, for for air toxics or or what's defined in Clean Air Act, and my colleague Rachel is also on the call. I asked her to join, um, and so Rachel, either get, let me know if I get anything wrong or correct me or whatnot. Um, but um, we know for like air toxics or hazardous air pollutants, um, the minimum where you'd need a permit, as far as I understand, is five tons. Um, excuse me, I apologize. That is a maximum for an option D. I don't know what the minimum is now that I realize that I was just studying that earlier today, but I was like, nope, that's the maximum for <laughs> an option D. Rachel, do you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it really depends on mm -hmm. the time. Oh, it looked like Emily maybe is here Ooh. too. Emily, oh, wonderful. Be great to answer <laughs> that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So um, an air permit is based on um, a facility actually operating 24-7. Um, that helps us identify if an air permit is required. There are certain thresholds for each pollutant. Um, like Megan was saying, um, 10 tons per year of an individual um, air toxic or actually hazardous air pollutant um, would trigger the need for an air permit um, and a total of 25 tons per year for all um, hazardous air pollutants um, where those additional, we also have those air toxics. Um, but some things that facilities are more likely to trigger is particulate matter. Um, our particulate matter uh, at 10 micrometers, uh, that if you exceed 25 tons per year, a permit's required. 
Um, and then volatile organic compounds, which a lot of our hazardous air pollutants and air toxics are, um, is 100 tons per year. So usually a facility will trigger, you know, that PM or the particulate matter or the VOC emission levels first um, before they tend to trigger those hazardous air pollutant toxics. Then if we say, okay, they're above those limits, we need an air permit. Then we look at what they are actually emitting um, to identify what size permit they would need. And what we're talking about, um, Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, with the air toxics, we want to see what facilities are actually emitting um, in, into those areas, um, what that exposure is and what those risk levels are. And that's where this gets even further down into the detail of which toxic or which hazardous air pollutant is being emitted because there is a wide range of um, values based on which chemical we're looking at, whether or not it is it is um, a very significant contributor or, you know, you can emit a lot of it without it impacting human health or the environment um, to a certain degree. Air permitting can be a little bit complicated. Um, so um, that's kind of why we bounced around this a little bit, but I'd be happy to, you know, discuss or answer any of your questions further. If you'd like. Well, what what I was leading up to is that you know the PCA has this small hazardous waste generator permit for people who generate quote unquote small amounts of hazardous waste, and uh, I, was, I was wondering whether or not they saw this as being something similar, or 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 are they are these chemicals such that you only find them in being generated by fairly large industrial processes. This isn't something that your local veterinarian would be be uh, required to have, as he would a hazardous waste generator. Right. There's not. I'm not going to pull on any circumstances where a veterinary clinic would be required to have an air permit. Um, that's very um, odd circumstances. If they did, they would be doing other activities. So there's a lot of businesses that this wouldn't um, bring in. When we talk about the small quantity generators, um, that is waste development. So usually if they're doing painting or coating or using solvents, um, you know, they often produce a small amount of hazardous waste. So the waste that they generate um, is separate from the air emissions. Um, so the air emissions go direct to the air. So the mm -hmm. waste is actually a reduction of those um, being emitted for that facility. Uh, there are small source rules that would apply to things like an auto body. If they're using um, less than 2000 gallons of coating and solvent a year um, and have no other significant air source emissions, generally that means that they are exempt from getting an air permit. Um, and there's a couple of different scenarios like that where a facility wouldn't necessarily trigger air permit requirements. They may still be emitting some of these toxics, but um, not into an amount that we find to be a significant contributor. Okay. One more question back to Megan, if I can, which is about the toxic odor uh, regulations. Uh, I was noticing there that your your uh, PowerPoint said that an odor investigation can be started when 10 people make a complaint. How persistent does the odor have to be to generate a complaint? Does it have to smell, smell bad every day, once a week, six months? That's a really good question. And that is, those are precisely the kinds of things that the the rule team that is working on that rule are working on right now, are trying to figure out. Um, the legislature did provide some uh, kind of specific, you know, that, that you know, 10 people would trigger it. It's a subjective um, uh, understanding of, of odor. Um, but what, what triggers that is exactly what they're trying to figure out right now. We do that that will be in their proposed um, concept document later on um, as well. Thank you all. That's all for me. 
Hi, this is Melody. I work for the Small Business Assistance Office also, but there is another question um, in the chat that says, can you share anything about Minnesota Carbon Free 2040 initiative? That's a great question. I don't know much about that and how it applies to the MPCA. Um, I think we're also trying to figure that out, um, but uh, Rachel or someone else from the PCA, does anyone have any? I was just going to. I was just going to chime in a little bit. Um, I, I also don't know much about that Carbon Free 2040 initiative, but I think that relates more so to the Public Utilities Commission and switching over to um, carbon free, you know, energy. Um, so not so much the MPCA, but more so in the Public Utility Commission's wheelhouse. Thank you. Anybody else? See if we can stump the staff here. I did see there was a question farther up in the chat. Is there a limit to the size of businesses you assist? That would be an Eric question. Or Emily, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. I mean, we, we generally help small businesses with 100 employees or less, but we will answer questions from from any business that that contacts us. So we're here to help. And yes, we will absolutely share the PowerPoint. <laughs> Happy to do that. Any others? Neela, anything from you? No, not if there's not questions from the audience. We appreciate you sharing your time with all of us. And so if there's no more questions uh, on this topic, if anyone that's attending has any other questions for your peers or others attending the call, we'd, we'd welcome any type of calls then at this time. Hi, this is Jessica. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, um, if you're opening it up, I have some questions on the BOI report reporting for the federal government does uh, from the state agencies. Does anyone have any information on that? You speak about the beneficial owner reporting? Yes. Uh, may, we may be able to help you a little bit. Tell me what the question is. Well, so I filed mine and it was rejected earlier this year, but my accountant told me that there are several states that are suing and it's been put on hold and may not go into effect. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. should I be working on that or is that something I can let go until there's more information available? The honest answer is uh, I think you should continue to work on that. <clears throat> the uh... Uh, National Federation of Independent Businessmen uh, filed a lawsuit back in October against the Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, uh, saying that the requirements of the um, Corporate Transaction Tort Transparency Act were unconstitutional, uh, and that um, a U.S. District Court in Alabama uh, agreed with them and enjoined the uh, enforcement of that of the uh, of the BOI requirements, but only against the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. So not not against you and me and everybody else. So the uh, Department of the Treasury, the FinCEN people, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, have put out a notice, and it's up on their website, the FinCEN website, saying that uh, please continue to report on this. That the issue is not yet dead. May not may not emerge the same as it does now, but uh, they are encouraging people to uh, to uh, to make those reports. Now that's of particular. I don't know how old your business is, but that's of particular importance to businesses that were created in uh, this this year, since they uh, they only have uh, you know 90 days to report. 
whereas the pre-existing businesses that pre-existed January 1st have Peace. until the end of this calendar year. So. Right. So, so I, I, I would uh, I would look at the FinCEN uh, website and see if it gives you any more clues. OK, thank you. There's another question about my question is, are the filters for treating PFAS in Cottage Grove being insinuated, insinuated? Do you have any data on emissions in regard to PFAS concentration? Is that okay if I just jump into it? Absolutely. Okay. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's a question back to us. So yes. um, great. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but we do. So uh, we do. We are proposing that there would be a number of PFAS um, on the uh, on our, our reporting list. Um, and there are a few a few PFAS, not all of them have emission factors that the uh, EPA has developed. Um, and so for those we we can um kind of understand what would you know if you're often given what's what's called a, a safety data sheet we assume probably a lot of most of small businesses would probably be using safety data sheets to determine their um air toxics emissions um and so that will help report um to uh on pfas to that um Otherwise, there are stack tests um, that most likely large businesses would have. And so I'm wondering if that's what this the color or the um, person may be asking um, around. Um, like we would love for more incinerators to uh, have do stack tests to know what PFAS are, are coming out of their stacks um, and more and more uh incinerators or or just general facilities will be doing um these stack tests and so then we'll know um and those facilities can report uh those those pfas um in terms of do we have any data on the emissions of what's potentially being incinerated i do not currently uh, but i will try and find a a um a link for you about where we do have our emissions um, information, uh, and I'll drop that in the chat. But if you have more more details on what you're asking there, I can try and clarify what I'm answering. <laughs> I'll stay on though too and hang out and try and monitor the chat. <laughs> so, anybody else? Not sure if this is the correct forum, but uh, I had a question about the dry cleaning fund. Eric, you have just a, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to try and ping Eric too, but yeah, you're you're looking for information about the dry cleaning fund. I just had a general question. Um, I obviously understand the purpose of the fund. Um, when it comes to you know use of the historic chemicals, but as an environmentally friendly dry cleaner that has never used any of those chemicals from day one, uh, it's doesn't seem quite fair and it's frankly pain, painful to cut a thirty-two thousand dollar check every year to pay for sins of uh, re relating to things that we were never a part of. And I'm wondering if there's any. Um, <clears throat> Anything coming down that might change the requirements to pay into that fund. Um, the way I kind of see it now, it's like asking an electric car company to pay for, you know, diesel pollutants. Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in real quick. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> taking that kind of year. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I we have heard those comments before, and I, you know, totally understand where you're, you're coming from with that. I'm not aware of any large changes um, coming up, but 
Um, I know Troy and Emily are on as well. They might have a little bit more information than I do, but um, what what I what I can do is, I mean, pass along that that sentiment to the the various folks that that are more aligned with that that fund. Um, so that that I can do, um, and in the meantime, if, the, if there's anything else, um, yeah, Emily looks like she dropped the link um, to some information there on, on dry cleaners, but we can follow up. So Emily, looks like you're on here. Yep, yep. So I'll just follow up. Um, I don't know if you're referring to the dry cleaning fee that's actually coming out of Department of Revenue. Um, that's not through MPCA. We just apply the funds. Um, for sites that need cleanup from prior activities. So we can look into it further, um, but I'm not sure that this is the correct agency that mm -hmm. has that fee. Got it, yes, that is the one paid through the Department of Revenue and then applied to those uh, dirty sites. But yeah, yeah. I, yep. I know there's been a lot of talk over the years, but it, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And that's a big number for a family owned business. Mm -hmm. Understood. 